Hi everyone. The purpose of this short video is to provide a quick overview of some different methods that can be used to value ecosystem services um, and also perhaps to establish some common terminology around ecosystem services and functions and the like. So first maybe worth noting that uh, economists, environmental economists and others would see ecosystem services and natural assets and the environment more generally as being the larger context within which the economy operates. So rather than the economy somehow being separate from that, that the goods and services that we uh, use for production and the uh, where we discharge our waste and so on all really occur uh, within the environment and don't occur sort of separately to that. Within uh, an undertaking uh, for ecosystem valuation. Here's a common representation of the different components of that, uh, where you have ecosystem structures and functions producing ecosystem goods and services through some complicated ecological production function. So this, for example, is the relationship between trees and water and different types of vegetation uh, and climate and uh, you know, micro um, organisms and so on, and the production of uh, and the sequestration of carbon or and the formation of soil and so on that then become useful for us in terms of producing food and uh, having a stable and livable atmosphere and so on. And those then we value in different ways and of course we have uh, different interactions that affect those. It's probably worth going into that a little bit more, uh, but noting that there's a high degree of complexity and a lot of uncertainty about that relationship between the ecosystem structure and function and the goods and services produced. That's a scientific uh, ecological um, investigation. And then this process here, which we're focusing on a bit more, is this economic valuation from those ecosystem goods and services into these different values. So perhaps just to go into it in a little bit more detail, uh, because we may often come across terminology that kind of equates ecosystem functions and ecosystem services together, I think it's good to separate them. So this particular table, which might be a little bit hard to read if you're on your phone, uh, comes from uh, a study that uh, David James and Simone Maynard uh, were involved in and, and many others in uh, Southeast Queensland. And I think it's a useful framework where you have ecosystem reporting categories such as seagrass and beaches and dunes and coastal zones and native plantations and so on the ecosystem functions that uh, relate to those, gas regulation or climate regulation or soil formation, pollination and so on, and there will be overlap between these. Uh, and then the different ecosystem services that are produced, for example, water for consumption or genetic resources or a habitable climate or water quality or arable land, and then how those relate to different constituents of well-being for us in terms of um, you know, nutrition or shelter or, um, you know, security and so on. So here's a common representation then of these relationships between ecosystem structure and function and the services that they produce and how we value them. So again, up here we have the ecosystem, its uh, structure and function, producing ecosystem goods and services, and then our human valuation of that, which commonly is characterized as, as having different types of values. For example, use values, which may be consumptive or non-consumptive and direct and indirect. Uh, for example, uh, we directly use nature to, uh, to recreate. We go down to beaches and so on. That'd be a non-consumptive use. We actually collect food and fiber and, uh, you know, so lo harvesting logs or uh, capturing fish and eating them and so on would be a consumptive direct use value there. Uh, but we also get these other values, and it's especially in relation to other ecosystem services that we don't consume quite so directly, for example, pollination-related services and how those, uh, you know, contribute to the ecosystem as a whole and the foods that we eat and so on, or soil formation and its relation to arable land and or uh, climate regulation and so on. So there's those other ones that are uh, more indirect uh, to us. And then there's a different category of non-use values, which are mostly around uh, our stewardship and bequest and our the way that we value the natural world, um, even if we're not directly interacting it, that we 
take comfort and place a value on knowing that uh, it's in an intact state, that you know there's whales in the ocean, that there are uh, functioning wetlands and, and that type of thing. That entire range of different values then is what we would attempt to uh, understand and measure and, and estimate uh, in term, especially in terms of economic uh, equivalence, to come up with a total economic value for a particular natural asset or for a particular ecosystem service or a larger area and so on. So maybe just before we get going, I think it's worth noting that within these valuation methods there are a wide variety of different approaches, market-based approaches, data preferences, reveal preferences and so on, and that they have strengths and limitations and will come up with a considerable range of different um, values, monetary values, uh, based on the scope and depth of the investigation and who is doing the valuing and the time frames and many other factors. So I think it's worth just really pointing that out to begin with. Further, it's probably worth noting that the idea that there could be an objective process of converting values um, to f understanding those relationships effectively and completely and then assigning um, and converting values uh, from ecological functions and services and so on into monetary equivalents is perhaps aligns more on the continuum of environmental economics but would be perhaps less uh, acceptable to strong ecological economists who would place more value on inherent and intrinsic uh, values that are really difficult to monetize, would place more emphasis on thresholds and tipping points and uncertainties and long-term sustainability and um, you know how future generations may value these that you know can't represent themselves right now uh, and just the complexity and so on ecological economists would more likely try to steer away from trying to assign monetary equivalents uh, to all of these different values. Another consideration would be that these values are likely to differ between um, you know, public and private uh, objectives and organizations and the people that are doing the valuing there uh, that uh, and those you know public and private entities would have different goals and objectives and uh, responsibilities and would take into account a either greater or lesser scope of people uh, including especially future generations uh, and may be looking out for um, values that you know one uh, one or other group would or wouldn't actually include and perhaps finally it's worth noting that these values are likely to change over time uh, in particular in relationship to their, you know, the state of our natural environment and the relative scarcity or abundance of ecosystems uh, in high quality states and the services they're providing. So for example, uh, if ecosystems are degrading and um, our beaches and forests and coastlines and ecosystem services are in a poor state, people will value the remaining ones and improvements to those much more than in a situation where they're all highly functional. So just to keep that in mind as well. So here's a few different approaches that can be taken and this is really not comprehensive but just a quick overview to give you a sense of the different types of um, ways in which we go about trying to measure, uh, to estimate and to assign a value to what is effectively goods that are not commonly traded in the market. So, and we're trying to establish here direct, indirect and non-use values. So one range of approaches here would be production function based or other market based approaches and here we would be trying to for instance, look at how a particular environmental good or ecosystem service contributes within a production process to something else, and then we would measure the change of value of that something else. For example, um, water in a river could be used to produce electricity, it could be used for recreation, it could be used for irrigation. We could look at you know, the production function and the relationship of water to producing those outputs in those different circumstances and then uh, figure out how much the water contributed to that output and the volume of that output and then assign you know, a final price to it to, to try to put that within a market-based uh, situation. We might look in a 
you know, in an estuary or wetland or coastal zone uh, for a particular habitat, maybe it's a, you know, a, f a fish habitat where spawning is occurring and so on, to try to understand that ecological relationship between the habitat and the, and the production of fish, and then figure out how many fish are um, then going to the larger area and being catched by recreational commercial fishers and use that for a measure of the, of the value of that habitat. An opportunity cost approach, slightly different, it would look at a habitat or an, an asset or a value in its existing state and then consider different alternatives for that same resource. For example, we might have a, an intact forest and we would, you know, option one or is considering that forest in its current state. Option two is converting it and cutting it down and, and taking the logs off of it or, um, you know, mining in it or putting a subdivision on it or a shopping center or something, and we can look at those different alternatives as the opportunity cost of keeping it in its current state. And I should mention there's, you know, obviously this will be a contentious uh, area uh, because of the difficulty in kind of capturing the other, the, the loss associated with um, moving from an intact to a degraded ecosystem. A dose response approach might more typically be used when we're trying to understand the relationship between a change in environmental conditions and their effect on uh, human or e ecosystem health. For example, um, increases in traffic and pollution and, uh, and smog or chemicals in the environment or um, you know, nutrification of waterways and so on. How those then would, how a change in those conditions would lead to greater morbidity and mortality for humans or for um, animals and plants and so on in the environment and then we would try to like after understanding that relationship look at the likely different scenarios for the relationship between that change in the environment and the impacts on human and ecosystem health and then assign uh, values based on um, losses, morbidity, mortality there. A replacement or restoration cost method uh, might commonly be used, for instance, in establishing the value of an environmental bond. For example, a mining company is interested in operating. Um, we would look at the potential risk of a tailings pond failing and you know being released into a local stream and how much it would actually cost to improve that stream back from its degraded to its original condition. Um, so it's really looking at what are the costs of uh, restoring an asset, um, an environmental asset, back to its original undamaged state. This range of substitute or avoided or averted costs, another kind of method, for instance, if we're interested in looking at um, what is the value of a mangrove forest on the coastline, we could consider, well, what would be the equivalent cost of some alternative substitute? For example, we might, you know, look at a coastal protection project to say, well, if, if the mangroves were in there, we had to get the same um, service of uh, preventing coastal inundation or coastal erosion. How much would it cost by some alternative um, that would provide that same service? Uh, similarly, we might have a you know forest wetland type of area that's improving water quality uh, through uh, ecosystem services and functions. How much would an equivalent technological intervention in a water treatment plant uh, cost to produce that same ecological service? So this kind of combination of a substitute or an avoided or averted cost um, forms a range of different methods there. There's another whole set of revealed preference methods here, uh, and they would commonly be used to, to try to figure out how much are people actually paying for some type of an environmental asset or attribute. Uh, one method commonly used would be the travel cost technique, and we might that would be a survey method. For example, we could survey people who are coming to the Sunshine Coast to understand how often are they coming, how far are they traveling, how much are they spending to, you know, to come to the Sunshine Coast and uh, you know have a day on the beach and uh, would go fishing or go sailing, whatever it is, to understand at the full cost of that, and through a large uh, survey and understanding of you know, this relationship between distance and cost and number of trips and so on, we can establish a effectively demand curve and, and consumer surplus and so on to come up with an economic value based on that travel cost technique. 
A different one would be a hedonic pricing analysis, and in this case what we're trying to do is isolate uh, some environmental attribute um, and determine how much people are willing to pay for it. For example, uh, we would look at otherwise identical houses, some that are close to the beach or some that are close to Badrum Falls or some that have a view of uh, the Glasshouse Mountains, and we would look at the difference in the sales price of those otherwise identical houses when they have that attribute and when they don't. And by doing that, we can see how much are people actually paying for uh, those types of attributes, and we can aggregate them up and estimate uh, values that way. There's a whole different category of stated preference and contingent valuation methods. These are more uh, going out directly asking people uh, about hypothetical situations for unpriced goods and services. So for example, we might uh, survey people and say, you know, we have uh, parks right now, but they're uh, largely inaccessible because there's no tra trails. Uh, we're considering a, a improvement um, process there where we'll uh, fix up the trails and mark the trails and provide better access and so on, how much would you be willing to pay for that environmental improvement? Or uh, here's a situation where we have a uh, fragmented habitat, uh, explain the situation to people and then say we're considering you know, a wildlife overpass, a corridor or something to join up to, together these different uh, locations, how much would you be willing to pay and, you know, through a range of different possible payment vehicles, how much would you be willing to pay to connect up, you know, to purchase to a piece of land, to uh, put it into a conservation state, or those types of things we can use this surveying uh, method. A similar but slightly different variant of that is when we present people with a bunch of different alternatives that have different attributes and characteristics, kind of baskets that they would then rank or, uh, or indicate their preference for. So for example, we might have you know, a, a basket that had um, a particular environmental situation where there was lower flooding and increased water quality. Um, and, but there was a particular cost associated with that. So for example, in this um, bottom diagram here, you can see option A, we have you know 25 year frequency of flooding, pretty good water quality, and an increase in the water bill of three pounds per year, uh, compared to uh, much reduced flooding with improved water quality, but a higher charge on the water bill, or no charge and uh, this current situation of you know regular flooding every three years and, and moderate to poor water quality. So people then evaluate these different options and indicate their preference and by doing so we can uh, t determine how much they're willing to pay and therefore how much they value different types of environmental characteristics. All of these methods together then um, can kind of be used in different ways and, and especially it's possible to look at what has previously been done in one location and transfer those values over to another location. So you can imagine already that with this large range of different possible methods and the you know quite large scope of the valuing Sunshine Coats Natural Assets project that we likely wouldn't be able to complete all of these different methods for all of the different attributes. So we may need to use a benefit transfer method, which is to say, for example, if um, wetlands or beaches or some other ecosystem habitat or natural resource had been, a study had been conducted on that in New South Wales, we might be able to take that same information and apply it in a similar uh, situation on the Sunshine Coast. So they need to be somewhat comparable, um, at, but at least it is one way of a bit of a rough and ready approach to coming up with, uh, with values for large area. All of this together can be used to undertake cost benefit or cost effectiveness analysis, and what that really is saying is looking at the costs and benefits of different projects or policies or other alternatives over a period of time, and especially focusing on net present value, which is to say the difference between benefits and costs, or the benefit-cost ratio, payback periods, and internal rates of return. Uh, so, for example, here in this image you can see uh, this is the constructed wetland uh, in Mullaney that Unity Water put in, and that would have followed 
first of all, a kind of environmental scientific investigation about wetlands and how the, and the function and the relationship between establishing a wetland here and the improvements in the uh, discharge water quality before it's released into the environment and comparing that to um, what would have been required technologically in terms of upgrading the, the treatment plant to produce that same quality of water discharge over a period of time. Uh, and we can use cost-benefit or cost-effectiveness analysis to, to undertake those investigations. So that's really just a quick overview of different uh, methods and approaches, uh, but hopefully gives a starting point for our discussions, and I look forward to talking to you more about those.